How old did ancient humans get? It's easy to picture a world where life was brutally short. A world where making it to age 30 was a rarity. But how accurate is this idea? Did they truly live brief lives? Or could they survive well into their later years under the right conditions? While it's true that life in prehistoric times was full of challenges, recent research suggests that early humans might have lived much longer than we typically imagine. We even have fascinating fossils of hominids that beat the odds and lived into old age. It's time to uncover just how long ancient humans lived, and why some may have enjoyed lives far longer than we typically imagine. First, we must understand the concept of life expectancy and lifespan. What is commonly known as average life expectancy is technically life expectancy at birth. For example, if a country had an average life expectancy of 70, parents could hope for their child to live this long. But the problem with this statistic is the way that it takes into account the death of infants. In some poorer nations, as many as a third of children die before the age of five. This gives these countries a far lower life expectancy of often less than 60. But in these societies, individuals who survive childhood live about as long as people in Western industrialized nations. This is why using a statistic such as life expectancy at 10 or life expectancy at 15 can give us a better picture of how old people actually get. When considering prehistoric times, you'll often hear that the average person only lived around 20 to 30 years old. The average life expectancy was indeed between 20 to 35 years, but this was mainly due to the high infant mortality rate of prehistoric times. It is estimated that the infant mortality rate varied between 30 to 50%. The individuals who were lucky enough to make it past their early childhood more often than not lived well beyond their 30s. By looking at contemporary hunter-gatherer groups, we can get a fairly accurate picture of how long prehistoric hunter-gatherers may have lived. In a study looking at 12 hunter-gatherer groups from four continents, fascinating insights were learned. Of the 12 groups, five were traditional hunter-gatherers, four were forager horticulturalists, and five were accultured hunter-gatherer populations. On average, 63% of children born survived to the age of 15. Of those who reached age 15, 68% reached the age of 45. Clearly people weren't suddenly dying off on their 30th birthday. Among traditional hunter-gatherers, the average life expectancy at birth varies from 21 to 37 years. The proportion surviving to age 45 varies between 26 to 43%. Life expectancy at the age of 45 varies from 59 to 69 years old. So the people lucky enough to make it to 45 could expect to live another 14 to 24 years. Overall, it was found that the modal death for adults, you know, from school, mean, median, and mode, the modal death for adults was 72, in a range between 68 and 78 years old. This is not too far off of modern societies with advanced healthcare. Another question that the study looked at was why were so many people dying prematurely? In the sample of this study, illnesses accounted for 70% of deaths, violence and accidents for 20%, and degenerative diseases for 9%. Throughout every age range, illnesses accounted for more than half of deaths. We won't go too far into detail about what these diseases were, but the study mentioned that infectious diseases were absent in newly contacted groups. Small, mobile populations simply could not support such diseases. Before moving on, I want to take one more look at Australian Aboriginals, as they can offer one of the best perspectives of how long prehistoric people may have lived. Many Aboriginal people lived hard, physical lives. To add to this, interpersonal violence was common in many regions. Infant mortality was quite high, which made the life expectancy often around 40. Despite this, early accounts mentioned individuals making it to their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. Though these people may have not had access to cutting-edge medicine and lived physically demanding lives, they also got plenty of exercise, ate a diet of all-natural food, and lived in the caring embrace of their families. Though we cannot compare aboriginals directly with the humans of prehistory, it is clear that ancient humans weren't suddenly dying off in their 30s. From contemporary indigenous people, we can also ascertain what function the elderly played in society. Among the Inuit of Greenland and Northern Canada, the elderly are relied on for their deep knowledge. The expertise of the elders includes animal behavior, how to read weather patterns, navigation, and specific hunting and foraging skills. The Shipibo-Kanibo people of the Amazon regard their elders as keepers of medicinal knowledge. 
Their ability to create and administer remedies for spiritual and physical healing is fundamental to their community's health. In Aboriginal communities, elders serve on councils that mediate community conflicts. In the Yongu community of Arnhem Land, elders resolve disputes by drawing on traditional laws. This form of mediation is highly respected and seen as central to maintaining social order and justice. In all these societies mentioned, elders are highly respected and cared for, even if they take up food and resources. When discussing the elderly in the context of human prehistory, it is often imagined that the weak and old would have had little value and may have been abandoned due to their leeching of food and resources. But how true is this? Geronticide is the practice of killing or abandoning the elderly. It has been observed in societies throughout history, particularly when resources are scarce. Geronticide usually goes one of two ways. An elderly individual is abandoned or chooses to stay behind for the benefit of the rest of the group. In particularly harsh winters, elderly Inuit would stay behind to prevent slowing down the group or eating up resources. This kind of self-sacrifice has also been witnessed during droughts in Africa and Australia. It is quite sad to think about making such a decision, but so commendable at the same time. Loving your people so much that you are willing to stay behind to freeze, starve, and get eaten, just for the chance for the young to prosper. Though this may be a little heartwarming, we must also consider involuntary gerontocide. Historically, this typically consisted of neglecting to care for the elderly, whether that be withholding food from them or other essential tasks. Others were simply abandoned and in very rare cases, killed. The Heruli, a Germanic tribe from the early centuries AD, were reported to practice ritual killing of the elderly. According to the accounts of Roman historian Procopius, when members of the tribe reached a certain age, they were killed either to prevent them from becoming a burden or as part of a ritual. This is a rather unique case, and I have not been able to find any hunter-gatherer cultures that killed their elderly for any reason besides a severe limitation in resources or the elderly hindering their mobility. If you know any other cases, comment down below, and also, guys, don't forget to subscribe. Now that we understand how old humans can get in contemporary hunter-gatherer societies and the important role the elderly can play, it is time to talk about prehistoric times. We have fascinating evidence that the elderly were cared for and valued not only in our own species, but also in other hominins. We have some fascinating evidence of old individuals in none other than Homo erectus. First appearing over two million years ago, Homo erectus is a very ancient species. As you learned in the last video, it also lived in a very dangerous world full of deadly predators and dangerous goliaths. Though our evidence indicates that people had compassion and some even made it into advanced age. Something we must first understand is that erectus may have not had the same lifespan as modern humans. We know that they matured faster, perhaps reaching adulthood in their early teens. Their earlier maturity combined with such a hard life of hunting and gathering with relatively simple technology likely limited their lifespans. The best evidence of erectus surviving into old age comes from Manisi, Georgia. Here the remains of Homo erectus have been found dating to 1.8 million years ago. These are some of the earliest well-dated hominin remains in Eurasia and also some of the best preserved. Five skulls from this site are excellently preserved along with postcranial elements and stone tools. And let me be the first one to tell you, these skulls are very peculiar looking. They look so different from one another that it was originally hypothesized that they belong to multiple different species. Though further research has revealed that they simply belong to a diverse population. They all have quite large brows, large jaws, and small brains. Their brains vary between 550 to 770 cubic centimeters. This puts them in the lower range of Homo erectus, but more similar to that of Homo habilis. They were also quite small at between 145 to 166 centimeters, or 4.8 to 5.4 feet tall. The most fascinating skull of this site, and the reason we are even talking about it, is because of Skull 4, the old man of Manisi. All of his teeth, except for the left canine, had fallen out. The tooth sockets had been reabsorbed into the jaw, suggesting that he had lost all of his teeth several years before his death. He would have been unable to chew up unprocessed meat or raw plants. His diet would have been limited to bone marrow, brain matter, or pre-processed plant and animal matter. Gathering all of this food and processing it on his own would have been very difficult. Considering his age, his body would not have likely been in great shape either. His survival depended on the care of others. 
It is unknown how old this man was exactly. Experts estimate that he was likely in his 40s, though it is possible he was even older. Regardless, he was clearly very old for his time and place. He lived a long and hard life, and in his twilight years, he was surrounded by his kin. It is so fascinating to think about these relatively small-brained and small-bodied humans surviving in prehistory. They had to hunt and gather everything they ate while taking care of old Toothless. These hominins undoubtedly cared deeply for each other. This skull is probably my favorite human fossil of all time. Though the flesh is gone, you can imagine what this old man might have looked like in life. Rest in peace to the old man of Manisi. Though this example made it seem like even very lucky Erectus would have not made it past their 40s, there is another point I need to make. Chimpanzees have been observed living into their 60s in the wild, and some have even reached their early 80s in captivity. Even gorillas and orangutans have lived into their 50s and 60s in captivity. In the right circumstances, even Homo erectus individuals would have made it well into their 60s, 70s, or even 80s. This would have been extremely rare, but plenty of erectus would have seen their 40th birthday. It is extremely hard to calculate how many individuals would have lived into their 40s or what their modal adult lifespan would have been, though it is clear that old individuals would have been present. To estimate how many erectus would have lived into old age, we can refer back to that fantastic study. On this graph, we can see the age-specific life expectancy for a number of groups. Importantly, this includes prehistoric humans and wild chimpanzees. For Homo erectus, a life expectancy would have likely fallen in between the range of these two. I do have to state that this is life expectancy at birth, so about half of Homo erectus born would have not even have made it to adulthood. But we can see that 10% of erectus born would have likely made it to be 30, and around 5% would have made it to their 50s. I would love to see a study estimating ancient human life expectancy from age 15. That could really show us how many old erectus would have been present in any given population. We have found fossils of around 200 different Homo erectus individuals, which might not be enough to conduct a study like this considering many of them are fragmentary. Though the remains of over 400 Neanderthal individuals have been found, which could help us better determine the life expectancy of this species. Neanderthals and modern humans had a common ancestor around 500,000 years ago, meaning that our two species were quite related. Hell, many of us, including myself, have Neanderthal DNA. But they were still different than us. They were shorter, stronger, had larger brains, and reached maturity faster. Neanderthals lived very hard lives and were often severely injured. In fact, 79 to 94% of Neanderthals sustained at least one traumatic injury during their lifetimes. This was often due to attacks by large animals, something you can learn about in this video. But anyways, Neanderthal life was extremely dangerous, though we know that some persevered. The most fascinating example of a Neanderthal that made it into old age is Shannondar 1. My apologies if you have heard about him on this channel before, but his remains may be the most interesting of all time. Discovered in Shannondar Cave, located in Iraqi Kurdistan, his remains consist of a skull as well as postcranial elements. They have shown us that he had one arm, was partially blind, and crippled. At some point, he sustained a serious blow to the right side of his face, which may have caused paralysis to the right side of his body and led to a withered arm. The arm may have actually been amputated. If so, this is by far the earliest evidence of amputation. However, this has not been conclusively proven and may forever remain enigmatic. He was also crippled with evidence of severe injuries to his legs and degenerative joint disease. Lastly, he also had substantial deformities in his ears that would have caused significant deafness. He certainly could not have participated in hunting and would not have been an efficient forager. His deafness, partial blindness, and trouble moving around would have also made him an easy target for any predator. Despite this, he survived for many years, likely reaching his mid-40s or 50s. Though he may have been a burden to the resources of his people, they fed, cared, and protected him for years. His usefulness was in his humanity, stories of hunts long ago, extensive crafting knowledge, and jokes for which his own father once told him. Shenandar I is the ultimate testament to the compassion and humanity of the Neanderthals. He is also an example of the advanced healthcare that the Neanderthals were capable of. Many things could have killed Old One-Arm, but he was likely cared for until his final breath. I also want to make the point that Shenandar I was in terrible health and still made it into old age. A Neanderthal that didn't get severely injured and lived a good life certainly could live into their 60s, 70s, or even older. 
It is easy to think of Shannon Darwan as an exception, a joyful old man who was somehow permitted to live by his uncharacteristically compassionate tribe. But this is not the case. Other Neanderthal remains indicate that Neanderthals cared for each other until their final days. Another Neanderthal fossil from La Chapelle aux Saint France consists of a man between 40 to 50 years old missing most of his teeth. He also must have been cared for by his people. It is fascinating to imagine that some Neanderthals would have lived even older and would have met their grandchildren or even great-grandchildren. Our ancestors were around during the same time as the Neanderthals, so the vast majority of us lived in Africa until waves of migration left around 100,000 years ago. We faced many of the same challenges as Neanderthals and likely had a fairly similar life expectancy and lifespan. I am not aware of any fossils of very old modern humans before the Upper Paleolithic. But in the Upper Paleolithic, we do find a number of fossils that did live to old age, the most famous of which being Cro-Magnon I. He is estimated to have lived into his 40s or 50s. He definitely was showing his age as he had severe arthritis and suffered from a genetic condition called neurofibromatosis type 1. This caused him to have large cysts or tumors on his face, which you can clearly see on his brow and cheeks. The other individuals found at the Cro-Magnon rock shelter were also of advanced age and showed evidence of healed traumatic injuries. These individuals were all cared for seemingly until their timely demise. The rock shelter has been interpreted as a burial site and there is evidence of grave goods. None of these individuals seem to live past their 50s, though they were also suffering from serious injuries. Some Upper Paleolithic people certainly made it into a later age. If you have watched any of my work on the European Upper Paleolithic, you would know that significant cultural and technological advancements were made during this period, and this may have allowed individuals to reach older ages than ever before. The life in the Paleolithic was still very difficult. It was during the end of the last glacial period, and many lived in cold environments chasing after megafauna. After the last glacial period ended, the Earth warmed, and many species of megafauna went extinct. These changes would lead to what we call the Mesolithic. Without as many large animals, human cultures became less mobile and focused more on foraging and fishing in local environments. They still lived a hunter-gatherer lifestyle and consequently their life expectancy would have been pretty similar to their ancestors from the Paleolithic. Though their ability to stay put for weeks or months may have allowed these individuals to reach an old age. Human life would fundamentally change with the Neolithic Revolution. The domestication of plants and animals allowed our ancestors to have a surplus of food and no longer live the difficult lives of hunter-gatherers. This revolution happened in at least seven different regions and would spread all over the planet. Neolithic life consisted of relatively sedentary lifestyles and the reliance on a few crops and animals led to poor nutrition in some cases. Larger Neolithic societies also led to class division, where the poor often had to work hard for little food which was also not very nutritious. Evidence shows that life expectancy at birth during the Neolithic could be as low as 20 to 25 years in some regions, compared to the 30 to 35 years in many hunter-gatherer populations. Over time, these populations had to biologically adapt to surviving diseases such as tuberculosis. Eventually, these individuals developed stronger immune systems and their life expectancy would gradually increase. Nutritional deficiencies would remain a major factor limiting Neolithic life expectancies. Individuals who made it into adulthood may have been able to live longer than their hunter-gatherer ancestors. This was because a surplus of food made their survival much less of a burden on resources, and a sedentary lifestyle was much easier for the elderly. Though these factors were in favor of the elderly, nutritional stress and infectious diseases would counteract them. Overall, the elderly would have not been much more numerous in the Neolithic than prior periods. Even in the Bronze Age, life expectancy was between 28 to 38, which is in the range of contemporary hunter-gatherers and likely Paleolithic people. Hunter-gatherers lived, and some do still live, incredible lives. Death may lie behind every corner, and many don't make it to adulthood, but the lucky few can enjoy long lives, even longer than many in modern society. The myth that hunter-gatherers hardly saw their 30th birthday is a misunderstanding that I hope you now see as false. Any given group of hunter-gatherers would have had individuals in their 40s, 50s, or even older. The elderly were valued for many reasons, and could even be integral to the survival of a group. 
fossils such as Mini C4 or Shannon Dar 1 show us that ancient people were compassionate and took care of their elders even if they were disabled. The elderly were therefore crucial to the story of our ancestors, the greatest story ever told. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning about the ones that came before. If you enjoyed this video, why not learn about all of the animals that Erectus ran into, or all the animals that Neanderthals ran into? Warning, these videos are extremely interesting. And also, don't forget to like and subscribe, and please comment any video ideas on what I should make next. This has been your host, Northo2, and I'll see you in the next one. Arrivederci and adios.